This is my friend Cedric. He's going to tell us about the keel boat. Hi, welcome to Fort Union. We're here on the keel boat here. It's called the William Ashley, the General William Ashley. This boat has been up and down the, uh, the, the river so many times I can't even count. Right here, we got the sweep. A lot of people misconstrue this as a, a, a rudder, but it's not a rudder. Rudders generally go back and forth like this, and that's how they steer. This is a sweep, and it performs more of a sweeping motion. And you can actually get power in it to push the rear, push the front, and drive your boat left or right, depending on which way you want to go. So it's a little bit different than a natural rudder. Although, you can stand here as the captain watching Oh, and use it similarly uh, as a rudder. Uh, Our keel boat is two thirds, uh, uh, a two thirds uh, model. Okay, so it's about two thirds the size of a yeah, real so keel that, boat. If we had 33 more boat feet, boat we'd be the full length of a, of a modern uh, keel boat in its day. We would have tons and tons of trade goods, blankets, uh, everything you can think of that would be ordered in St. Louis, loaded inside the cabin here making the 1800 mile trip all the way up here to Fort Union or maybe even further going up to Fort Benton. We'll be pulling that with uh, a big rope. We have about 20 guys on our crew. We'd have a big rope called a quarter lane. We'd be pulling this rope. This rope was about three football fields long, about 900 feet. So if you take into consideration the weight of the rope, it's probably wet, so that's gonna be weight too. The weight of the boat, I mean, you have those things. Everyone's pulling over two thousand pounds pressure on that rope. And that's up there. And the current. And the current, you're pulling up against the current. You and know, the we, wind. We, yeah, and the wind, yeah. I mean, we, today we have our sail up and it's, it's, it's doing an alright job, but you can't always count on that because the wind is very fickle, it moves where it wants to. Also, the river, since it moves really, you know, winding patterns, you can have a great wind going one way, and then all of a sudden when you're turning, it's not going to help you at all. So that's not really a primary source of energy getting us up the river. We would need that. Another way we could do that is by use of poling. Down here, Sawyer's got a pole in his hand. What it is, is you would shove that thing into the water, and on the end of it would generally be a ball that you'd put into your shoulder. You would put that in your shoulder and you would push it all the way down. Like this. So. Put that thing in, and you'd start down here, put it in, and then you would walk down this whole walkway and be pushing. You'd have about four or five guys on this, depending on the size, and you'd be pushing it. And everyone asks, well, why won't you just go like this? If the main way that you're pulling this up is with that rope, you have all your muscles in your legs, all the muscles in your back, because you're pulling it. Why not use those same muscles to push it? Sure, you've got developed arm muscles. I'm not going to argue that. But this is where your power is at. So they're going to push and push and push and push until the captain says, up, pull. You pull that up, you run back, and you start all over again so you don't lose any momentum. Right. Can you, can you speak like the Missouri River mud? Yes. I mean, when he says pull it up, I mean, you need to, like, twist, pull it up, get it out, because those things are going to be stuck in there. And you have to be quick because when your pole's in the ground, the captain can't time that he is incapacitated because if you have four or five pulls on this side four pipe I mean it's just holding you in place when he says pulls out and you run back that's when he gets to correct course or make sure that he's going where he wants to go so you really have to be Johnny on your spot you really have to make sure you're not falling off or anything and these guys didn't do that I mean they were they were highly skilled highly skilled and you have oars as well, right? Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. Oars, we use those a lot. Um, coming home, coming on the back trip down, we'd use these a lot in helping with your sweeper to help steer. And because, I mean, you have all this power driving you down now, so now how do you slow down? Well, there's only a few ways you can slow down, but you can help steer and control yourself better if you're using your oarman. So you have your catman up there, You'd have your second man up here telling us, okay, I see a tree in the water, I see a sandbar, and he can tell you which way to help your captain to steer and maneuver your boat. Awesome. Awesome. So, how many, how many trips is this now? The Ashley's retired, right? The Ashley is retired. I was told that it was over 
300 trips is the number that the unofficial number that I was told there was over 300 trips that it took. Um, the last one that was was taken, uh, Sawyer and I are on. Uh, it was back in 2018. It was the last time we remember being down with Cat and Mike, and I mean, the the crew that was with us. I was honored to be a part of it with those guys. They they took living history to the limit, and they, we really made this whole trip feel like we were back then, right? Like we were living it. So it was. Yeah, yeah. Well, to me, it's like living history. It's not living history unless you're not unless you're living it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Like, and we tried. We did everything we could. Don't bring any of the modern stuff. I mean, just bring everything at its core that we need right here. It was a great trip. It was wonderful. Awesome. Totally awesome. I didn't think I'd have to do an episode by itself. <laughs> That's awesome. Yep. It's the next part. All right. This here is what we call a heave line. Okay. On the boat, we have these big, long, big, giant cord lane lines that we haul with or that we can tie off when we're docking. But we can't throw them very long because they're so heavy and so big. So what sailors would have would be heave lines. They generally have a wooden ball on this, although they started out as lead and then people found out they sank really fast and they didn't like getting hit with them. <laughs> so now we have wooden balls inside of these because imagine if you're sinking out there and you need help, someone can throw it out. You don't want a lead ball coming out, you want a wooden ball. So they got this monkey's fist on the end. What they would do then is they could throw this to shore they could th throw this to someone who's in the water. They could throw it to another vessel nearby because it's lighter, you can get it further. And then you can either pull in with this or tie this onto those bigger ropes that we have on board. So you do something like this. I think I got it. <laughs> yeah, that gives you, you just chucked it out. Oh, no, how far is that? That's about. 60 feet? You know, the, the book says a, a good sailor can throw it out about 50 to 70 feet, depending on what's inside the ball, yeah. yeah. Which is, I mean, a far cry further than those big tie-ons that we do when we dock and everything like that. So, yeah, a heaving line, a sailor's best friend. You use it for a lot. And then when he went on shore, he could take this, whip it over a branch, hang up part of his sail from it or part of a tarp, and then, you know, there's his shelter for the night, too. So brilliant. many different things you can use it for. Oh, that's brilliant. Cool. He even lied. Anything else? <laughs> you know, can you think of? I, I don't know if I have anything. I mean, I got a couple of, well, hey, here's something for you. Do I still have it on me? Yeah, sure, bring our in. I gave a drawing of this to our blacksmith and he whipped it up real quick. Oh, I was there when you put when you built it. This yeah. is a bench hook. So a lot of times when you were on the, on the open water, Something would happen to the sail. You'd have to fix it. You'd have to repair it. Sails are so unwieldy. They're giant. And if, they're, if you're on your... And they, they shift a lot. So what they would have is they'd have one of these. They'd tie it on to something firm, pretty, pretty solid, like if they're sitting down like this. They'd have the sail on them, and then they'd, they'd adjust it, hook it into the sail. So it's like a third hand to hold and stabilize. So they'd hook it on right there. It's holding the sail. It's not moving. Now I can work on it without worrying of shifting or anything like that. It was like their best friend because, I mean, you don't want to waste two guys to sew on one sail and repair it or anything like that. So, uh, you got a four point up there. Yep. What, they, what, what do they use normally for sails? Oh, they had all sorts of different things. Um, down on the ground, we have a, a sail that we had last, from a couple years ago. We have a linen one and a cotton one down there, yeah. Is it oil scanned? No, that white one right there. This one right here? Yep. So that was off of one. We've actually started using that as a shelter, so to get out of the sun or yeah. when we're sleeping at night. Yeah. And some of the just the gear they had, eh? Right? And that's not a sail? Nope, that is an oil cloth or a yeah, fish yeah, skin. Oil. A fish skin. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's basically like a poncho. Let's see it all in turpentine. Yep. Right. Yep. Yep. A lot of different tools that some of these guys would have. Um, really common one would be the FID. FIDs, I, 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 <laughs> FID? FID, yep. Yeah. These things are invaluable. Like if you're working on a knot, like when I'm on my monkey's fist, oh, if you're trying yes. to feed a rope in there, 
you can't do it and your fingers can't pull it. You just, I'm serious, you just shove it in there and it comes back and you can just put the rope right through. It makes it so much easier. Also, if you're up there and you're trying to make a grommet on your sail or on your ditty bag, you take your sail or your ditty bag, wherever you want to put it, we'll say we want it somewhere over here, you decide which size you want to make, so say that. Take that, you put your fit on it, you take some sort of mallet that you have, whack it down, all of a sudden there's your hole perfectly made, and then you just sew on, sew on that. Yeah, exactly. That looks like a blanket stitch, is that what that is? This one? No, 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 on your... Wow, that's a... The hole there. Blanket stitch. Yep. Cool. Cool. Yep, they have all sorts of things they could use a... A seam rubber, if you wanted to uh, be working on something that they wanted a crisp, clean, nice fold on, they'd fold it over and then they'd rub it down and it would keep its form, keep its nice crispness to it. Um, marlin spike was also very common, which is basically the metal version of, of this. You could also use these, yeah, like the same thing as a fid, yep. Um, you could put those on, you could use those with knots and everything. Um, believe it or not, you could use wooden knives to help make creases on, on the, the sails and stuff that you're making. And you, you'd use that just kind of like the fid, and you come down and make the crease line on it and make a nice crisp clean. Um, I was blown away when I found out they had like wooden knives, wooden things like that. Yeah, I, I, that's a new one on me too. Mm -hmm. And then of course, you know, you'd have things like, you know, you'd have uh, all sorts of needles, you'd have wax, you'd have all sorts of different types of thread or cordage and stuff like that. Um, yeah, yeah, what kind of needles were they using? They had sail needles, and sail needles have uh, three sides to them. They're not a round needle like common people would use. They had three like sides a, to them. Like a glover's needle. Like a glover's needle. But they always warned you not to have them too sharp, because they, they wanted them a little dull on the sides, because they didn't want you to, to be actually cutting it. They want to pierce through it, but they don't want you to, to cut your fibers. So they'd always say um, to kind of wear them down first just a little bit, so you wouldn't be destroying you know, the fibers and making okay, new yeah that makes yep. sense was, uh, were they curved were they yeah there were some that had a curve at the end yeah exactly exactly yeah. they had them for whatever um whatever job that you were doing you would have a certain hook it was straight curve or an s um or the c uh whatever one you felt best with but yeah always making sure that it, they weren't too sharp on those three sides I would have never thought. I mean, I was reading them like, oh yeah, it's like a glover's needle. But then they said, warning, do not use glover's needle. Or if you know, you make sure that they are not dull, but just you take the edge off of them a little bit. Yeah, um, and then I, I was reading the journals, you know, the Court Discovery Journals and Clark, when they built the, the experiment. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? He regretted using glover's needle, sail needles yep. for that iron boat and the skins. They couldn't patch them up. Yeah, exactly. You, it's, it's working right now, but then down the road it's causing more problems, yeah. is what, is what hands, ends up being, yeah. And the bosun's whistle, what does what it tell them? Oh, there's all sorts of different uh, uh, calls, whether it's high pitch, low pitch, uh, if they're warbling pitches. Um, they, it's like a, it's kind of like the trumpets, you know, they're telling you different um, commands and stuff like that. I own one. And that's it. <laughs> I have the sheet that tells you what it means. That's great. I can't. No, no I can't do it. <laughs> kind of, kind of. Yeah, I, I, got you, I have yeah. to work on that. I'm a, I have to work on that. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds, sounds like a all night in a bottle of rum. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things, too, that I also have in mind, well, the last time that we took this down the, okay. uh, the Mighty Mo in 2018, I actually have uh, the a replica of George Washington's fishing kit. Oh, yeah. I was able to take this off of the stern and caught myself a huge river cat. Oh, really? Huge river cat. Oh, that's awesome. And we, we ate it that night. Um, a friend of mine that was on the trip cooked it up for us. Oh my gosh, I had never had fish like that ever before. It was so great. Oh, that, so yeah, wonderful. That, that, yeah, that's just icing on the cake. Kind of it, it was great. So yeah, I mean, I shared it with all the guys in the, in the group and we were we got full and I was like, oh man, I'm full. And he just looks at me, starts laughing. I said, what's, what's, what's so funny? He goes, turn it over. So I flipped it over. And there was still meat on the other side that we hadn't touched yet. I'm like, gee whiz, these things have meat on them. Holy cow. This is breakfast. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> Cool. Yeah.
Cool. Yeah, I can. I think that probably could cover about eh? Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'll just. She's just inside. Uh -huh. Just All give right. it a. Give it a quick look around. Thank you so much, Cedric. Yeah, no problem. So this reproduction. So the inside. How many tons does this hold, Sawyer? Yeah, it holds anywhere from between 16 and 25 tons of cargo. 16 uh, and 25. Yeah, both this small. Some of the larger ones were 120 foot long. So pretty significant. Pretty, you can imagine the amount of cargo that would be going down. The river. Yeah, yeah. The absolutely. amount of guys that it would take yeah. to actually take that cargo down river. And the interesting part about a keel boat is uh, you've got your flat boats on the Ohio and the Mississippi River. Those are actually going to be moving most of your cargo, uh, by far. Uh, the keel boat has uh, kind of a mystique in American culture uh, because these are the professional river okay, So the guys gotcha. who their occupation is doing river stuff. Everyone else is doing river stuff in addition to their other job, generally. You know, gotcha. if you're a flat boatman, you're actually a farmer. You know, you're, you're a farmer taking your produce down to New Orleans. Whereas if you're a keel boatman, oh man, you're on the open water all the time. You're kind of wild. You're kind, you know, you're kind of rough around the edges. Right, the Mike and, Finks. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And, and Mike Fink, more myth than fact yeah. at this point. Yeah. And in the historic time frame, as early as 1830, there was a play about Mike Fink. Oh, is that right? So he was I... already more myth than fact when he was still alive uh... in some cases. There's some songs from even earlier about Mike Fink. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I always compare it to, uh, it's kind of like Smokey and the Bandit in trucking. Yeah. You know, there's like all this mystique, there's all these, uh, you know, uh, CB radio culture associated with these keel boats. Uh, when in reality, you know, a lot of it wasn't anything like this. Okay, yeah. You know, and yeah. so the, uh, the, all of a sudden the culture starts informing the myth, the myth starts informing the culture, and uh, you get this really interesting hodgepodge of... Uh, this is the only river craft that is going to be going both ways, both up and up down, and down, up and down, up and down. And because they're always on the river, that kind of makes them that makes them interesting to the average person who just stays on the shore. You, know, you see these wild boatmen, and you wonder, oh, what kind of life adventure you live? Honestly, you're probably just pulling, or you're probably just pulling. Yeah, you just work your butt off. <laughs> yeah, not, not much of an adventure. Yeah, okay. the food is probably. Yeah. The, the food Dicey that, at times. I, I did some research into that. I'm actually going to be eating some probably tomorrow. Uh, not like this, but uh, one one traveler is uh, watching as a boatman comes in to the kitchen with you know whatever serves as a kitchen. Takes out his knife to the uh, slab of bacon that's hanging off a hook. Cuts off a strip of bacon and starts eating it. And just walks out. No time to cook. And, uh, so that gives you some, that gives you something. Of a, uh, of a picture of it and then if you do have time to cook it's usually bacon in corn uh, that seems to be the meat yeah, the stand. bacon in corn <coughs> and the pay and the pay uh, we're looking at probably somewhere in the neighborhood of $125 a year uh, you can sign up for one year contracts or three year contracts uh, three years seems to be pretty popular uh, both with the men and with the captains you know you want some more experienced people I think they were probably just looking for dollars. So at, a, at 125, what that would that be today? Wow, dollars. Oh gosh, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure. I know the uh, average farmer makes about 150 dollars a year yeah. in uh, you know in this time frame, and so that's that's someone with you know his his 40 acres and it's all his and, and all that, and he's feeding himself. So man, 125 bucks a year is actually quite a bit for someone with no training whatsoever. You walk onto the boat, yeah, you get to work, yeah. and you live a life that's pretty rough for a couple of years, you might just get your farm. <laughs> well, thank you for that, sir. You don't Absolutely. mind me putting that on here. No, go ahead. Cool. Go ahead. Yeah. I appreciate that, mate. Yeah.